Hi, Collective Table. This is Claire. Yes, I am still bopping around here, editing behind the scenes, and wow, do we have a great episode for you today. Today's episode features Rabbi Sharon Browse, who discusses her book, The Amen Effect, Ancient Wisdom to Heal Our Hearts and Mend Our Broken World. So if you have not had the chance to read it yet, we have a link in the show notes to go grab yourself a copy. Rabbi Sharon Browse is the senior and founding rabbi of Ikar, a leading-edge Jewish community based in Los Angeles. She is a leading voice at the intersection of faith and justice in America and even had the opportunity to bless both President Obama and President Biden at their national inaugural prayer services. So if you're wanting to hear more from her, we've linked her socials in the show notes as well as her viral TED Talk, Reclaiming Religion. Today's conversation covers so much, from grief and healing, to tribalism, to loneliness and connection, so you are really in for a treat. We hope you enjoy. All right, Collective Table audience, we are just so thankful to have everybody with us today or whenever you're listening to this episode. And we are excited to introduce and talk to Rabbi Sharon Browse and talk about her new book, The Amen Effect. Without further ado, we're just going to dig in because there's just so much to have a conversation about um, and we want to get it started. So Rabbi, thank you so much for for being here and joining the Collective Table podcast. Thank you so much, Dana and Chelsea. I'm so happy and honored to be with you. I have a quick clarifying question. We say amen from like the Christian tradition a lot of times, but I've heard it say amen. Is is it amen effect? It's actually one of the reasons that I loved that I love the word so much is that it has a resonance in so many different traditions. So it's in Hebrew we say amen and I and I kind of code switch back and forth. So it's totally okay. Amen, amen, amen. It all works. What is Amen, Amen effect? What is that? And why is this term, why has it resonated with you so deeply at this point in your life? This story sort of starts with the fact that we're living through multiple intersecting crises in our world right now. And at the heart of a lot of it is the crisis of loneliness, social alienation, and isolation, which we know as rabbis and pastors, it has a profound impact on the spirit. We also now know from science and people like the Surgeon General have been really speaking very powerfully about this. The data now shows that loneliness has a profound deleterious impact on our physical systems as well, that acute loneliness is essentially the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day in terms of its impact on the heart and the lungs, et cetera. And we also know that loneliness and social alienation are really driving a great fracturing in our society. And as as the great 20th century political philosopher Hannah Arendt wrote, loneliness and social alienation are essentially preconditions for totalitarianism, that tyrannical regimes and totalitarian regimes cannot take root in a society when people really know their neighbors and really connect with each other meaningfully. And so we have this crisis of spirit, of body, and of society. And the idea is that we're, we're kind of disinclined toward connection right now, but we need connection biologically, spiritually, psychologically, and socially. And so the amen effect is what happens if precisely at the moment that we are most inclined to pull away from each other, instead we incline toward each other. Instead of retreating, we show up for each other in celebration, in sorrow, and in solidarity. We essentially say amen to each other's experiences, whether those are experiences of joy or of pain. And in that way, we kind of re-stitch together the social fabric that's so torn apart in our time, and we can begin to heal as individuals and also as a collective. It's so interesting that, you know, we're, we're talking about this, we're recording this episode uh, the day after the eclipse. And as I was listening to different news stations and just different people's reactions, the one thing that struck me was that they said, this is a, a, a time where all humanity just comes together. Like we don't have that very much right now. It seems like we're all fragmented and disconnected, but yet in this moment, we're reminded that we're one. And I thought, well, that's what kind of, cause at first I'm like, it's a beautiful thing. Yes. But people were crying and emotional. And I'm like, why? And I thought, oh my heavens, it's because 
people feel so separated right now. And this kind of brought us together. Yeah, it's so true. I, w- I was actually, I was walking from one place to another during the eclipse yesterday and we had a couple pairs of these glasses and my husband and I literally became, we were like eclipse evangelists. I mean, we were going up to be strangers on the street saying, you have to look at this and just witnessing people's responses and reactions. And it was astonishing the way that people were so moved by it. And also for many people, it was a very spiritual experience. Even for people who don't think of themselves as religious, they just thought, I'm a part of something so much greater than me right now. And that's an incredible unifier. But I also noticed yesterday that different people reacted differently. There was a kind of collective awe or collective effervescence in the language that some of our some of us use now. But also I noticed that some people looked and said, oh, that's cool. And other people said, tell me there's no God, tell me there's no God, or this is the most incredible thing I've ever seen. And I realized that that too is a choice, that the way that we respond to these kind of external stimuli is really reflective of our own hearts and our own capacity for connection. And so I I was very moved by the the overall experience. And, And we desperately need something to connect with each other around. And I was thrilled that it was something beautiful in the natural world that could bring us together in that way. I think there has been a lot of news, information, energy around this idea of connection, this thing that like we're built for connection. It's so deeply ingrained in us somewhere. And yet we still live these very separate lives of individualism and ego and power and and all of this stuff. And what you're you're talking about, like this fabric that's connected, it's hard to other somebody that you know their pains and their celebrations, and yet we don't. And I'm just wondering, like, what your thoughts are around that? Like, we know now that we, you know, especially after COVID, how lonely we were, how much health decline, you know, all the the information that came out. What it what's standing in our way? It's interesting because COVID definitely exacerbated the sense of disconnect in our society, but it did not initiate that. I mean, in fact, if you look at the loneliness studies, there's a certain turning point moment or tipping point moment around 2012, which happens to coincide with when most people in the world got onto social media. And so there's some sense that technology is also contributing, which was ostensibly designed to help us connect with each other. And in right now, in this moment, is helping us connect with each other. And yet it also contributed in some really important ways that we don't still fully understand to the decline of real connective tissue between, between human beings who would otherwise search for and yearn for real human relationships. And so before COVID... I read two studies that really shocked me. And one of them said that more than 20% of Americans have not one person who they would describe as a confidant, not one person who they trust in the world, who they can bring their pain, their fear, their worry, their love, their dreams, their joy to. They just don't have anyone who they really trust. One in five, that's astonishing. And then there was another study that said that one in three Americans do not know the names of their next door neighbors. Like we're that disconnected. And then COVID came. That, that, those were from 2019. So COVID kind of landed on this, you know, on this terrain that was already very fragmented from the years before it and only exacerbated this because, of course, when we were forced to separate from each other, on one hand, we found ways to one another through the screen, but we also kind of habituated to the distance, uh, to the social distancing And that's been very painful. And a lot of people still haven't been able to come out of that and reestablish relationships. We kind of got, we got more comfortable on our couches, on our, in our individual kind of isolated pods than, um, than we really are oriented. We should, we, then we really should be. I mean, biologically, we need this kind of connection. And when you think about experiences like the experience of grief, for example, I think that that's where this myth of American individualism really you know, really begins to falter and fail for people because we have to grieve together. We're not designed to grieve alone. Part of the process of grieving in, in, in so many different traditions is about actually expressing out loud the pain that's in your heart and the longing and also laughing together and weeping together and sharing stories and sharing photographs, all of these things need to happen with others. And so when we isolate ourselves and then we're further isolated from one another and then something like a loss happens, 
we don't even have the tools to begin to find a way to healthily work through the kind of emotional journey that we would naturally go on after a loss. I'm I'm thinking about loneliness and the other topic that comes up and I'm trying to understand the connection is you talk about tribalism in your book and you talk about the benefits of it. And then obviously the negative impacts of tribalism. Do those two things connect tribalism and loneliness and and what, what does it look like? And and what do we think about it? Like, what do we do with it? Yes. So can I, if it's okay, I'd love to take a step back and give you a kind of visual for this. The central paradigm of the book is a Mishnah, this ancient uh, compendium of Jewish law, which this ancient text talks about an ancient pilgrimage ritual that used to happen at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So Jews used to come from all across the land and also from the diaspora, and they would make their way to Jerusalem for pilgrimage festivals. And they would ascend the hill, the, Jerusalem's a city on a hill, and then they would climb the steps of the Temple Mount, the most sacred place in the most sacred city in the world on the holiest of days. And they would enter through this beautiful old arched entryway, and they would turn to the right and circle around the perimeter of the courtyard en masse, hundreds of thousands of people all at once. They would do one giant circle around the courtyard and then they would exit right where they had come in, except for somebody with a broken heart. And that person would go up to Jerusalem, up the steps, enter the same entryway, but they would turn to the left when everyone else turns to the right. And what would happen is a sacred encounter would occur between the individual with the broken heart and the collective, the community that's going in the opposite direction. When they would see the broken hearted person, they would look into this person's eye and say to them a very simple question, what happened to you? Tell me about your heart. In Hebrew, malach, what's your story? And this person would answer saying, my father just died and I'm upside down about it. Or my partner just left and I'm totally blindsided. Or I just need someone to tell me my kid's gonna be okay. Whatever the pain is that they're holding in their heart. And the folks who are coming from the right would look in their eyes and offer them a blessing. May you be held with love as you navigate this time of darkness. May the one who dwells in this place help you find hope through this challenging chapter ahead, whatever the blessing was that would come from their heart, and then they'd continue on their way. And that's the essence of the ritual. And what I realized that's so powerful about it and why this particular fairly obscure ancient ritual has become really my North Star for the last 20 years is because none of the parties to that ritual want to be there. (laughs) The person who's brokenhearted does not even want to get out of bed, let alone show up in this place with hundreds of thousands of people, all of whom are walking in one direction and they're literally walking in the other direction, which is what so many of us describe when we're brokenhearted, right? If it feels like the whole world is moving one way and I'm moving another way. And here we learn that was actually part of the ancient ritual. They had an embodied ritual to help people experience physically what they were feeling spiritually. And the people who are okay, the last thing in the world they want to do is break away from their family and their friends and their loved ones. It's one of the most joyous experiences of their lives to be there. And I, in, in preparing, in, in researching my book, I read a lot of firsthand testimonies from pilgrims who had gone on the Hajj to Mecca. And I just read their stories and it's incredible. Like people describe just bursting into tears the moment they arrive and they're just swept up in this crowd and they feel a part of this great collective in this really indescribable way. The last thing that person wants to do is peel away from the crowd and break that feeling because there's a stranger coming toward them with puffy red eyes, right? It's totally counter instinctual. And yet that's the encounter. And so what it's saying to us is lean in, lean in, lean in, even and especially when it's hardest. So most of the book is actually an exploration of what it means to be on both sides of that circle, why that's so hard, and what some of the tools are that we have that can help us orient toward each other. But then we have to think about not only what happens when the person is coming toward us in the other direction, but what happens when someone's coming at us in the other direction? What happens when the person is not brokenhearted, but actually someone who's caused us pain? Maybe they hold views or perspectives that have hurt us or hurt the community. How do we engage them? And what we learn here is that we speak to them in the same language. We see them. We look into their eyes. Ask them, Malach, tell me what happened to you. And they say, I've been ostracized from the community. I've been excluded from the community because I've done wrong. 
And instead of kicking them out the door and saying, you don't belong here, we also bless them. So that's that's the overall framework. And the question is, how does that apply to our lives today? What do we then do with the pain in our hearts and the people who've caused us or our communities pain? And so to go back now to your question about tribes and tribalism, tribes, I've said earlier that we are fundamentally relational beings, that we need each other. We need our tribes, people, we, we naturally orient toward people who look like us or talk like us or pray like us or vote like us or all of those things. And that's not a bad thing because we do need to situate ourselves among a community of people who can help us navigate some of the most difficult moments in life. But the danger of tribes is tribalization of a society because we now know through science that the deeper our affinity to our tribe, the stronger our connection to our immediate tribe, the more indifferent or even hostile we feel toward people who are outside our tribes. And so what ends up happening is that the very thing that gives us comfort leads to a kind of fracturing of the greater community, the broader collective. And so what this ritual does for me is it essentially reminds us our job is not only to see the people who look like us or the people who pray like us or vote like us or talk like us, but actually to see the other too to see the one who's coming in the opposite direction, who might even be coming at us, not toward us, but who is still a human being created in the image of God and deserving of our genuine compassion and our curiosity. And what changes in our lives, in our hearts, and in our social policy if we adopt that worldview instead? That even someone who I am not I am, I'm not inclined to even see because they're, they're not even walking in the same direction as me in this world, but even they are human beings. Can I see their humanity? And if we place that as a kind of priority in our, you know, in our, in our everyday, I believe that a lot would shift and I know that it can help us heal both as individuals and also as a, as a collective. When you're talking, I'm like getting inspired, right? Like I'm on your team. I'm, I, I get what you're saying. I, until you say that vote like us. And for me, it just feels like a gut punch, right? Because right now this political climate really, it, it is so polarizing or feels so polarizing. And there are people that are are actively working against the rights of people I love, of women, of, you know, of, of the oppressed, of the marginalized, of real life implications. And what I love about your book is that like your convictions don't have to become less for your love and compassion and flexibility to be there. But that's really hard. Like to stay convicted to like, this is the right thing. Like this is justice, right? This is the flourishing of all people, whatever the fill on your, and then say to someone who's politically different, who's working in, in, in opposition to that, I love you. I, I see your, you know, humanity. Like it's hard. So I'm just wondering if you could speak, especially in this political time where I think that that really is a tension point for people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, seeing someone else's humanity does not mean inviting them for your, you know, 40th birthday party. It doesn't mean you have to actually be friends with them. And it also doesn't mean that you're ceding to their political agenda. On the contrary, actually, what it actually does is it allows us to remain human as we pursue the just cause that we know that we believe in and that we're trying to build. And it prevents us from turning another person into a caricature of themselves. So we're seeing them as people with agency who make different choices than we do and who are often also driven by fear, by pain, by sorrow, by anxiety. And I have found that in the process of pushing myself to humanize somebody who's on the other side of what feels like an existential question, and there are many in our time, that what it does is it, in a way, it rehumanizes me it allows me to affirm my own humanity because I am not turning you into a cartoon. I am treating you as a person who's responsible and accountable for your own behavior and who I'm holding responsible because I see your humanity. I won't call you a monster. I will never call another person a monster or an animal. That, that dehumanizing language doesn't just dehumanize the other, it dehumanizes the person who's using the language, right? If you're able to, to shrink someone else's humanity, then your own humanity is also shrinking. 
So instead, I am seeing you in the fullness of your humanity as a person who's using your voice and your vote to do things and say things that are causing harm. And even still, you're a human being. And here, I think a lot about what Brian Stevenson writes, um, the head of the Equal Justice Initiative and built this incredible legacy museum and lynching memorial in Montgomery. And Brian writes that every person is more than the worst thing they've ever done. If we believe that that's true about some people, how can we not believe that that's true about all people? And so I, I choose to see the humanity. I seek out the sorrow. I want to understand, even from someone who's hurt me, where's their pain? What's driving this? Not because it's going to change my vote. It's not because I know I'm right. I know, I know I'm on the right side. I'm on the side of those who are working and fighting for a just and loving society for all. I care about equity and justice and equality, and I want human beings to thrive. So my, I'm not going to change my, my view of that goal, but what I am going to do is I'm also going to see that person as part of that human community instead of essentially relegating them to somewhere outside the scope of my moral concern. I'm also concerned about their humanity. It doesn't change my vote, but it forces me to expand my sense of who they are. And sometimes, sometimes when we approach those conversations in the right way, with genuine compassion and curiosity, sometimes some seeds can be planted that could flourish into a kind of transformation. And I give in the book, I talk about a couple of stories where, I mean, there are so many stories where that didn't happen, but I share, and I share a couple of the failures in some way, not the failures. I, I share a couple of versions of the story where, you know, nothing grew out of it that I know of, but then there are also a few times where actually seeing someone in their humanity ended and staying curious about them ended up shifting their own approach and I will add that I gave a talk when my book came out with Father Greg Boyle, who's a brilliant and wonderful Jesuit priest who started Homeboy Industries and who's a great hero of mine and so many, especially in Los Angeles, where Homeboy, that's sort of the heart of Homeboy, and he wrote some incredible books. And so I had a conversation with him about what he does in his work with former gang members and the formerly incarcerated to help them move through shame back into reacquainting themselves with their own agency and their own dignity. And he said that the most important thing that he does is he just looks into the eyes of literally rapists and murderers, like people who've caused grave harm. And he looks in their eyes and he says, you too are a child of God. And he said, this is the first thing in their work toward their transformation. Because he said, for many of my guys, Nobody's ever told them that before. And that's part of what led them to behave the way that they did in the world. Seeing someone else's humanity doesn't mean that we're giving up on our own commitments. And it doesn't mean that we're shortcutting our own work, our organizing and our, you know, our kind of principled activism toward building this just world. What it means is that we're allowing ourselves to believe that all people are created in God's image even the people who hurt us, and that very often there's pain at the heart of someone's story when they dedicate their lives or engage in behavior that's set out to harm others. It's The root of that is very often pain. And so if we can put a little bit of light in their direction, who knows what might be possible. As I'm listening and I'm processing, what I hear from you is I hear intentionality in the sense of you're committing to a way to behave in the world, and then you're actually doing it. So you're sitting down and you're looking at people, you're talking to people. Um, so it's not just words, it's not just an intention, but there's action that's connected to that. And it sounds so simple, but yet it's so complicated and difficult to incorporate in our own lives. When you're talking to, I'm, I'm, and with Father Greg Boyle, who Dana and I both love and a hero of ours too, I want, I'm wondering if you could speak to how that does kind of start with ourselves, like seeing the humanity in our own selves, right? Like in the Christian tradition, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes we get so wrapped up and I got to love my neighbor. I got to love my neighbor that we forget that it starts with our own self-worth and like recognizing we are children of God ourselves, letting the inward flow outward, you know? And I'm wondering if you have, speak to that at all. Yeah, I think this is an ongoing tension and struggle. And in the in the Torah, in the book of Leviticus, in the Hebrew Bible, it says, kamocha, that you have to love your neighbor as yourself. And so we spend so much time focusing on the love your neighbor part 
that we often don't reflect on the fact that the gauge that we set for what love looks like is the way that we the way that we love ourselves and many of us don't love ourselves we aren't tender toward ourselves and so how do you how do you do that and i think that different people are oriented differently so for some it needs to flow from self love to out to to love of the other and for others it actually has to come in the other direction so i'm thinking about there's a there's a very powerful hasidic text that said that describes that every single human being has within them a nikudatova a little point of goodness that's just pure and good in everyone that's pure goodness that's gifted to you by god by virtue of being a human being in the world you have it and sometimes when you're engaging someone it's really hard to see that point of goodness and because there're layers and layers and layers of schmutz that cover the goodness and make it hard to see they distort it and cover it and for some people it's really almost impossible to imagine that there's goodness in them but he says our job is to lift away those layers so that we can let that little light shine in each person okay i'm saying i know that there's resonance in other you know faith traditions also to this kind of language and at the end of this very lengthy passage about how we have to remove the layers of schmutz and see this in someone else he says and if you can do that in someone else how much the more so do you have to do that for yourself and it's very it's kind of a very simple closing to a really beautiful discourse and you realize that for some people we actually are able to work in that direction that we for some reason we fight harder to see the goodness in someone else than we do to see it in ourselves it ultimately whether it starts there and then it trains the heart this way or it starts here and then trains the heart out, outward we actually have to do both i mean ultimately we have to learn how to hold ourselves tenderly and with care and how to hold each other tenderly and with care. And so it's one of the thing the reasons that I I felt this was such a such an important conversation for this moment is that we're breaking as individuals, we're breaking as communities and we're breaking as a collective. Like the what's shattering is happening is multidimensional. And so the processes of healing have to also be multidimensional. And I will also just say that part of what drives my thinking is the recognition that we who care about building a just society cannot build a beloved community out there out in the world if we fail to strive to build the beloved community internally in our most intimate spaces in our own faith communities in our own churches and synagogues and mosques and and in our own homes and so i i mean i i said to my kids some years ago after a particularly contentious and and terrible election my kids were really devastated and they were little and they came into the room the morning after the election they said what happened what happened and we told them and they burst into tears and threw their little bodies on the ground and they were worried about us they were worried about us as Jews they were worried about our muslim friends they were worried about our black friends and our queer friends and they were worried about what was going to happen to america and i wanted to cry too i mean i felt the same way that they felt but i pulled it together and i said to them listen to me as the world grows more callous and more cruel and more indifferent we need to build an oasis of love and justice in this home we need to become more compassionate kinder more patient more resilient more honest with each other because we we are exactly who we were yesterday but now the world's gotten worse so we have to get even better and they were like okay ima okay we're going to do it and for like a minute my kids were amazing they were like not fighting with each other and you know but then i realized that that was actually the sermon that i needed to give the community too because the community felt like my kids did i mean we were all on the floor crying you know and i said to them this is the moment where that dream that we hold of what the world could look like we need to realize that dream now now here and it will reverberate out and so whether it comes from the inside and reverberates out or from the outside and reverberates in it's absolutely essential that both of those truths become are realized in order for us to really build a loving society I love how you're talking about and this was something I was just thinking of we other people right like we we characterize people we make them cartoons and and personalities and all those things and a way to combat that is to get to know people right I think people are at a loss of even how to do that like how do I find a friend that is a, of a different culture race faith voting preference you know like 
what tips do you have to kind of like start that process of engaging with people that might be different? Because we do stay so close to like who we are, right? Like our tribes. And I noticed, especially in the wake of George Floyd's murder, that people wanted to engage. They just, they they were really at a loss at, as to how. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It's actually connected to Dana's question from earlier when you asked about how to operationalize these ideas. So it doesn't just feel like that's a good sermon, What am I supposed to do now? And so one of the things that I did in the book was I took for each big idea, there's a practical, tangible, I call it a spiritual practice, but it's a really accessible practice that we can take on in order to start to do this work of rewiring ourselves and our collective. And so one of them speaks specifically to what you're asking about. So back to that study about how we don't know our neighbors at all. One day, at, right after Yom Kippur, the, it was the morning after Yom Kippur, the biggest uh, and most important and holiest day in the Jewish year, I slept in. And so I left the house later than I usually do. And when I did, my neighbor across the street was out in his driveway. And so I said hello to him. And honestly, I I mean, I had lived in that house for maybe a decade at that point. And so, and he'd been there for many more years than that. I'd never seen him before in my life. And so I said, hello, and we started to chat and he asked what I did. And I said, I was a rabbi. And he said, oh, it was just a Jewish holiday yesterday. And I said, yeah. And I told, I started to tell him what I had just preached about which was this incredible empathy study that came out of some, you know, some neuroscience lab. He was a part of the team that had done that study. My neighbor across the street actually authored the study that I quoted in my High Holy Day sermon, which I had no idea even came from, you know, came from an LA team. I mean, I had no idea and I never knew him. Okay. So what do we do about this? Like, how do we find our way to each other? And in that case, it's not somebody with a different political perspective, but it's just somebody different from my bubble. And so the practice is this, take a slow walk around your neighborhood once a week, like make that a spiritual practice. Tuesday evenings, I take a slow walk around and say hello to absolutely everyone you pass and introduce yourself to the people that you don't know. And I started to do this during COVID. I started to go on runs every single morning, a short run, and just greet every single neighbor. I'm running like less than a mile and a half. And I'm just meeting every single person. And now it transformed my neighborhood for me. I know my neighbors now. And they're all different kinds of people there. You know, so this is one of the things that we can do is we actually have to go out of our way to expand our tribe and see somebody else as part of our tribe. I don't think that an effective way to expand our tribe is to counter protest to someone's protest. Like that, you don't, and nobody ends up growing from that. I think to find ourselves in relationship, to start to invest in and build relationships relationships with people who aren't exactly like us, and ultimately to have conversations, even hard conversations, again, not to convince the other and not to be convinced by the other, but just to understand each other more deeply, that that's really holy work. And it can start in the supermarket. I mean, literally just by greeting somebody in the supermarket and saying hello to them, it can actually shift our experience of that person and create an opening for a relationship. One of the things I was wondering, you've done several different interviews. You've talked about the book uh, all around. And I'm curious, has, is there something, is there a topic that you feel has kind of been left out of, of the conversations? Is there something that hasn't really been, you know, we haven't deep dived into and and what, what, if, if so, what, what would that look like? Or what would that be? I'm just kind of wondering what's been kind of left off the table. Oh, it's so interesting. What a great question. (laughs) Actually, you, you know, all the conversations are different. And it's a short book, so you might not think that that would happen, but everybody who reads it sort of sees something different that they want to attach to. And so it hasn't been the same conversation over and over again. In many ways, it's been, you know, it's like a hundred different conversations, but you know, I'm one of the things that I'm really invested in and interested in is caregiver trauma, vicarious trauma which is something that I just don't think we talk enough about in our culture. And this idea, if you go back to my paradigm of the pilgrimage ritual at the Temple Mount, the question is what happens to the people who either by nature or by profession are always walking to the right and circling, circling around from the right and keeping their eyes up to see who's the straggler, who's, who's got the red puffy eyes, you know, who's the bereft, the bereaved and the ill who I can go take care of what happens to them or to us? What, where does that, all that grief go? Where does it live in the body? And so 
that's something that I'm always eager to explore more of with people because one of the things that I uncovered in my research there is there's a whole literature around vicarious trauma now, which is, you know, it's a really interesting kind of trauma because it's a trauma that comes to people who take care of others who by nature don't want attention to their own pain. And it's not my loss. It's someone else's loss. I'm just helping them navigate the loss. But the fact is that helping people navigate loss means that we're also we're also ingesting the loss ourselves. We are ingesting their trauma. And what I've learned is in the language of my sister, who's a, she's an environmental justice activist, and she's been really like working deeply in deep grassroots movements for many, many years. And she said, if you don't metabolize the pain, the pain will metastasize inside your body. And I've just found that to be so true and consistent with the, with the data now, which shows that caregivers have this incredibly high rate of burnout, helplessness and hopelessness and depression and addiction and guilt and shame and pain. And, you know, and either people leave the field or start to engage in self-harming behaviors. I mean, it's very, very dangerous and it doesn't have to be that way. If when we talk about it and when we learn how to metabolize the pain, we can actually have very long, beautiful careers in which we're able to hold people, you know, careers or lives, because for some people, it's not their job, it's just their nature, but we don't talk about it enough in our society. So that's one of the pieces that I'm glad I'm able to lift up. And only some people, generally, it's like the pastors and the rabbis want to talk about that. And the, you know, the psychotherapists want to talk about that. But everyone else wants to know about tribalism and universalism and how we talk to people who, you know, who voted for the other guy. And so, which, I, which is also really important. I mean, it's all part of the same, it's all part of the same, I think, conversation. Yeah, no, that's funny. I've done some work with, you know, in grief counseling and uh, talked to chaplains and in hospice care. And I've often wondered how do they manage, I mean, their lives at times, because they're so heavy, there's so much intensity of dealing with death and, and, and so you, what you're talking about is exactly what I see a lot of those individuals deal with and something that is often not discussed or really managed or you know, held. Because I'm so interested in this conversation, my father died just before the Jewish holidays this year and in, at the end of August. And the last week of his life, he was in hospice. The book was already long closed and hadn't come out yet. So it was, it, I was right in between kind of closing the manuscript and launching the book, but I'm really interested in this question. And so we had the most wonderful hospice care workers who were in the ho house with us. And they were, I mean, they were like angels. They were incredibly gracious human beings, but I realized that literally their job is to begin to build relationships with people when they are in the final chapter of their lives. And so, and, and they gave us so much of their hearts and their time, and they really were invested in us. And they, they both, I mean, they really were, were engaged in, in real relationship building with us. And I just, I thought, how do they do this? How do they go from one final chapter to the next final chapter? Because for me, I also get to do weddings in between. And I also get to do baby namings and give sermons about like art and creativity and, you know, all, you know, generative construct, all the things but for them, it's literally from one death to the next. And I asked our wonderful, one of our ner wonderful nurses named Art, he called himself Big Art. And he said, he's w working with the, with the energy that's in the room. And then he walks outside the house and he takes a big breath in and a big breath out. And he really has to actively kind of allow himself to shed some of the grief so that he has the strength to even go home and be with his family, let alone go to the next patient the next day. And so I feel there are these mechanisms for allowing ourselves to go through this. And the spiritual practice for, for me, for that chapter of the book, is we have to let ourselves be held. We who hold others have to let ourselves be held. And it's so counter instinctual for us. And we're the ones who are like, no, no, I'm okay. I got this. I don't need a meal train. I, you know, give the, I don't need it. Give it to someone who needs it more. But actually letting someone else bring a meal to us is, is a gift of, of love to them and also self-love as you were saying earlier. And so I, I think that that's, that's really, really very critical. 
And it just it connects us back to being connected and caring for the for another person, the meal train. That's right. And when you're so used to walking to the right, you forget that every human being walks to the left at some point, right? All of us will be among the bereaved, the bereft, the ill at some point. One of the most beautiful things about this ritual is that when we're broken, we bring forward our vulnerability because we trust that we will be met with love from the other direction. And so what does it mean to allow ourselves to be met with love when we need it the most? And just to trust in that process. One of the things that I took away from your book so much was the the power of, of presence, of showing up. And so Rabbi Browse, we just want to thank you for showing up, for being part of this conversation, for not just your time today, but the work that you put out in the world. It's really important, it's especially for right now, learning to see each other as children of God, like you were talking about earlier, especially when the world is telling us not to, right? So thank you for your work, for your tools, for your story, for yourself. We're really grateful. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Thank you, Dana. I'm really grateful for both of you and all that you do in the world.